our speaker. So we welcome Dr. Win we welcome Dr. Wendy Winterstein, uh, who became the 16th president of Iowa State University on November 20th, 2017, after a nationwide search followed by a unanimous vote of the Board of Regents of the state of Iowa. The first woman to hold the university's highest office. And she has served Iowa State for more than 40 years in several capacities. Uh, one of the most recent times then was 11 years as the endowed Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the director of the Iowa Agriculture and Home Economics Experiment Station. Uh, and as president, uh, with the support of her administrative team, Dr. Winterstein is advancing Iowa State University for the 21st century uh, for the <clears throat> priorities focused on enhancing student success, recruiting and retraining excellent faculty and staff, strengthening innovation and research excellence, developing a culture of entrepreneurship, making Iowa State a national leader in creating a welcoming and inclusive campus environment, and growing state and private support for the university, its faculty, staff, and students. She is married to Robert Wagner. Uh, Dr. Winterstein has been a club member and Rotarian for 12 years, and we're very proud to call her one of our own. And I think uh, we have all recent, uh, recently and ongoing have witnessed her as a true leader, uh, not just by title, I think, but how she builds uh, her relationships and, and guides people and uh, very authentic leadership. We're proud to have her as a member of our club and proud to have her as our program today. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Winterstein. Well, Chad, thank you so much for those uh, kind words. And I'll just share, as Jean did, that my internet connection is also showing as unstable. So we'll see, see what happens here. Um, I have to tell you that I miss seeing all of you at the Gateway Center and enjoying a delicious lunch together. Uh, so hopefully soon uh, we'll be all uh, back together. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, let you look at something besides, uh, uh, besides uh, my face. I can do this here. Um, let's see. Let's see. Does anybody see that yet? Let me try one more time. It's showing up, Dr. Winnerstein. Oh, thank you so much. Good. Um, let me get there too then. Technology. It's, it's not as easy as it looks. So, um, great. We, we see your screen, but we don't see the file open. Okay, let me try one more time. Does that help? It didn't, you gotta click on it more because it didn't open up. Okay, um, boy, sorry. There it comes. <laughs> Where's, Okay, it is. is it there now? It is, is there, there now. Just now. Yes, okay. it's there. Okay, well, thank you all. So I just wanna start by celebrating commencement. Uh, so we had a, about a little more than a week ago now, uh, our commencement, our virtual commencement, had more than 5,000 students graduate uh, from Iowa State University. This was after a semester that you all know uh, ended up in a very challenging way, but we were so proud of how our students responded, so proud of how our faculty with just a week's notice put 6,000 courses uh, online so that we could continue to see our students make progress in their education. So it was a virtual commencement ceremony. Uh, the photos you see here uh, are reminiscent of a year ago, uh, not what happened a uh, little more than a week ago. But the enthusiasm, uh, the fun uh, that our students had with their families in this virtual environment uh, still uh, meant the uh, celebration that we hoped that they would all have. Well, when we think about how our team at Iowa State has responded, it really has been with creativity, innovation, flexibility, and care. 
And these are just some photos of the many individuals that have uh, continued to work uh, during this time, uh, whether they've been working on campus, and we have a lot of folks working on campus uh, every day, or if they're working from home, uh, doing uh, finance, teaching a course, uh, whatever it might be, uh, th these are the types of things that you would see if you think about the Iowa State community. Down there in the lower uh, set of these photos, you'll see a young lady and an individual, and that's a, a, a young lady is uh, living in residence halls and was picking up her meals uh, from dining services. We've also been running a food pantry uh, because of the extreme need uh, to support students uh, who really need assistance during this time. So lots of different activities have been occurring and we're just very proud of what has uh, occurred in these last couple of months. We're also very proud of the relationship we have with the city of Ames, with Mayor Hala, city manager Steve Shanker, with the Story County Board of Supervisors, and our team meets weekly uh, with the city and county leadership to talk about how we work together uh, to make it through this crisis. So a community uh, uh, that works together uh, really does make a difference in being able to find success during this difficult time. Well, I wanna share a couple of success stories. Uh, this is a picture of one of our professors in uh, mechanical engineering, uh, Dr. Patalkar, and she's working in terms of taking metal oxide nanomaterials and placing them on cloths and other uh, services as antimicrobial agents. Uh, we think this is going to be a research area that really helps us respond in the future to other pandemics, to just uh, bacteria, just to everyday lives as we think differently about keeping a safe environment. And for those of you that don't know what a nanomaterial is, uh, you can put this fact in your uh, uh, file, and that is that a nanomaterial is a hundred thousand times smaller in diameter than uh, one of your hairs on your head. So a hundred thousand times smaller, not visible to the naked eye, even with uh, uh, an old style microscope that many of us uh, grew up using. So Dr. Padalkar is making a difference through her research in helping uh, do the work that will create a safer environment for all of us in the future. We're also very proud of the uh, university's veterinary diagnostic laboratory that is located uh, out at the College of Veterinary Medicine. And every year the uh, veterinary diagnostic laboratory processes more than 1 million samples uh, in their laboratory. And these are samples of uh, uh, sent in by our uh, livestock and poultry producers all over the state. So more than a million samples. And uh, more than a month ago, uh, they were asked to help the state hygienic lab uh, with their processing of samples. Uh, so the College of Veterinary Medicine, the vet diagnostic lab, took over to the state hygienic lab, which is located at the University of Iowa. They took over their robotic equipment, their reagents, and their techniques, and trained uh, the staff at the state hygienic laboratory in the use of this equipment. And by doing so, the State Hygienic Laboratory was able to increase the number of samples processed every day from 100 samples to more than 2,000 samples. So this was a big success, an example of how the innovation out at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory really helped everybody uh, in Iowa. And just recently, uh, the State Hygienic Lab asked if the Vet Diagnostic Lab would become a partner in testing for antibodies. And so that is a new uh, task that the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory uh, will be taking on here uh, as we get into June. So the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab was asked to help and they stood up in a big way uh, to make a difference uh, for Iowa. So two great examples of how we responded through our research and, and expertise. Here's a slide showing the engagement of Extension and Outreach all across the state. And you can see that there are 
are really three areas highlighted on the slide. The first is weekly activities through 4-H and youth. And my favorite one, if you can look closely on your ski, uh, screen, you can see the Clover Kids. And if you just peer in there, uh, one day on a Tuesday, they were learning all about chickens. Uh, they listened to a book online, they created a model life cycle of a chicken, and they learned to dance. And so I assume that's the chicken dance that they all learned to do that day. So the Clover Kids, uh, learning about chickens. And uh, in the middle is the important work of families extension that has gone on for hundred of years, uh, helping families with proper nutrition uh, to uh, eat smart, but to do so in a way that really helps them conserve their finances. So it's an important part of extension at Iowa State University. So healthy eating, healthy exercise. And then on the right side of the screen, uh, the work that Extension does to help answer questions. So our uh, regular Iowa Concern Hotline provides legal, finance, stress, and other types of counseling, and they're now part of the 211 system. So they too are helping Iowans all across the state in better being able to deal with the crisis and how it may be impacting their uh, very specific uh, situation. So when we think about the questions they got in March, uh, the questions increased uh, 2,400, uh, calls rather increased 2,400 calls more than a year ago in March. So a lot of questions out there from Iowans. Well, the uh, COVID-19 has had a big impact on Iowa State financially, just as it has on businesses all across the state and really all aspects of our lives. So our estimate back on April 6 was a lost revenue and refunds uh, totaling $88 million, uh, new expenses of 1 million. And this does not take into account the impact uh, that we've seen financially on our research program. Uh, when you add in what savings we've been able to account for in terms of decreased utility expenses and some other types of savings, we can actually get the number down to $78 million but it's been a tremendous uh, loss and we anticipate as we go forward that we'll see increased uh, cost as we prepare uh, for the future. Because of our concern about declining enrollments at Iowa State, uh, we made a decision that on July 1, we implemented a 5% reduction across all divisions at Iowa State. Uh, and then we stated that we would be doing a similar reduction a year from now. So essentially units are planning for a 10% reduction uh, at this point in time in their budgets. Uh, there's always the potential, of course, for that uh, situation to get uh, worse and, and we have plans in place in case uh, we end up in that type of uh, situation and having to do further uh, budget reductions. Well, we've been working our way through the COVID-19 uh, crisis with a great team. Uh, and you can see the structure of our emergency operations center that's been operating since January 27th. So today was day 113 uh, in terms of our response to the crisis. Uh, Chief Mike Newton uh, is the individual that is leading our emergency operations center. And he's doing that with a great team uh, Aaron Baldwin over the Tealand Health Center, and many, many other individuals on these working groups. You can see on the right side of your slide that we have a number of committees highlighted, uh, and one of these is the Fall Planning Executive Committee that's working closely with academic continuity and research continuity committees as we prepare for the fall uh, semester. So it's a complex operation that we run here at Iowa State University, complex under the most normal times, and that complexity is increased a thousandfold uh, when you're dealing with a crisis like the COVID-19. Um, we are also preparing for summer, and we're taking a phased approach. Uh, but first, it's important to remember again that since mid-March, many employees have continued to work on campus, operations and finance, residence hall and dining, police, research has continued in a limited manner. So probably on any given day, we have between 800 and 1,000 people 
still working on campus, uh, still following our guidance relative to uh, how they do so in a safe uh, manner. But now plans are being developed by our supervisors and will be implemented uh, to allow us to return necessary employees to campus. And this really means walking through workspaces, thinking how does this workspace need to change to be able to support physical distancing and other mitigation strategies that will be put into place, um, and recognizing that it's probably going to take us all summer to get to a place where we'll be ready uh, to have the employees that we need to have back on campus to welcome our students uh, back to campus. So it really is a phased approach uh, with some individuals returning here in June, really making those plans and implementing them and gradually seeing more individuals uh, coming back to campus. Again, building on that base of uh, uh, faculty and staff uh, and students that really have never left campus during the crisis. President Mike Richards, President of the Board of Regents, stated on April 30th that it is our intention to have our campuses fully operational this August. This decision will be made only if it is supported with guidance from the CDC, the Iowa Department of Public Health, and the Governor's Office and others. And so we are in the process of talking every day about what it means to have campus fully operational uh, and how will that look. What are, the, uh, what are the actions that are needed to make this happen and to do so in a safe way? Uh, what will we do in terms of uh, classroom uh, settings? What will we do in terms of our residence halls? Uh, how will we think about health monitoring and testing? And so a whole set of issues are being considered by those teams that operate under the Emergency Operations Center, those working groups rather that work under that center to help it guide us. What are the answers uh, to those big questions that we're working on so that we can in fact welcome students back to campus this fall? Well, this next photo is a beautiful photo from the past, right? Students walking across campus on a rainy uh, uh, day in April or May. And uh, you notice none of them in this photo are wearing masks, uh, cloth face coverings. Uh, but I think as we get back to what it's going to look like this fall, the photo will change. And instead of this uh, photo you see here, we'll be seeing students that will be walking and achieving um, some mitigation by having a cloth face covering. So lots of questions still to be answered. A campus is going to look different yet again from what it looked like uh, here in uh, March, April, and May. Uh, it's certainly different than it looked last fall, uh, but we're going to continue to excel in our missions of teaching, research, and extension, and serving the state of Iowa and our communities uh, here in Story County. But I'd be happy, Chad, now to answer some questions, uh, whatever is on uh, individuals' minds, and let's see if I can stop sharing my screen. Yes, I was able to do that. <laughs> so, any questions? If you have a question, Karen can see your hand up. I think she can, we'll scroll through, but I'll silence myself for a minute. If you unmute yourself, you can ask a question. George, do you have a question? Tom, Tom. hi Tom. Yes, yes. Okay, hold hey, on. Karen. We've got Tom on first and then George. Okay, well, well thank you. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, uh, Wendy, for that uh, very nice presentation. Uh, do you have any, um, any idea what numbers you're anticipating for enrollment this fall by opening up? You know, it's really hard to judge what will happen. Um, so we were already projecting a slight dec decline uh, before uh, uh, the COVID-19 crisis occurred. Uh, and now we have some very uh, serious concerns that there are some students that are saying this to us. Well, you know, if you're not sure what campus life is going to be like in the fall, I may take a gap year. I may just take a year off. Um, I may decide if I'm an out-of-state student not to come back to Iowa, but maybe I'll do a year here at a university in my home state. 
So there's a lot of um, fluidity, I think, in students' decision making. And uh, we'll know more in another month as students make a decision on whether or not they will register here at Iowa State or they'll make some other decision uh, related to their education. So I think that number is still just too much up in the air for me to give you a very concrete answer to your question. George? Yes, uh, first of all, wanting to commend you for your leadership on campus and throughout uh, our state. You are doing a great job under very trying conditions. Um, the $88 million lost revenue, I, I really was shocked by that. What is it made up of? Did you lose grants? Is it uh, people dropping out and not paying tuition? And then also, uh, I've heard at other universities, students have filed lawsuits um, because they didn't like uh, and didn't feel like they were getting their needs met uh, by uh, having online courses. Wondered if Iowa State is facing that as well. Well, certainly. I can't give you a rundown of the every dollar in the 88 uh, million category, but uh, $17 million alone accounted for the refunds we provided to students in terms of residence and dining and some course fees uh, that we refunded. And then there were losses in income that were significant to athletics, to the bookstore, again, to other auxiliaries that operate at Iowa State University that are key to the uh, student life experience that we have here uh, for the many reasons that students come to experience a residential campus uh, like Iowa State University. So it's all detailed out. We provided that to the Legislative Services Agency. And so all that detail is there. Um, when you look at uh, the lawsuits that have come up and mostly on the coast are where those lawsuits are occurring, uh, where students are saying that the online experience wasn't what they paid for, and so they don't believe they should have to pay the tuition that was charged. Uh, we haven't had anybody of any, there, you know, I would say maybe if I think back to the many emails I receive or my team receives, we probably received a couple dozen uh, emails from students or their parents saying they should have received a refund on tuition, but we are not providing a refund for tuition because we felt that we responded well and that students had a, a good experience. We did a Pulse survey with about 9,000 of our students, uh, probably uh, a month ago now, it's so hard to keep track of time, <laughs> to ask them how they were doing, uh, you know, were they uh, just giving us some feedback? And, and the feedback was really very positive. Uh, now that's, that's one uh, touch point, uh, but I haven't heard one student say to me, and of course I don't talk to all of them, George, but I haven't had one student say to me, boy, I'm gonna go online now, you know, Students miss being on campus. They miss the energy that they experience when they're in the room with their faculty member and their, their fellow students. They miss intramurals, they miss the club activities. So uh, going to uh, college, uh, going to Iowa State University, it's made up of a lot of things that you can't experience online. So you can understand why they feel that way about tuition, uh, but, but we provide a, a great experience, so hopefully we'll get back to what that looks like in the fall. Louie, you have a question? Thanks, uh, George. Yes, um, when you mentioned about being operational, I uh, was assumed that perhaps this means the faculty must be prepared to deliver either their, their uh, lectures to the students in person or online? Louie, that's correct. I, I think that we just don't know what will happen. And so we don't know uh, what will happen with the virus. And so, so we're gonna be able to do both. What we're very hopeful is that by being operational this fall, that means that students will be able to be here. They'll be able to go in and have labs, design studios, 
uh, do the experiential learning experiences that make the educational experience at Iowa State uh, so, so important, so valuable to our students. Uh, but it may very well be, and I, I think it will be, Louie, that when you think about a big lecture hall with 300 students in it, I don't think that's gonna occur. I think that's gonna occur online. But hopefully we'll be able to do uh, the type of interactions, the hands-on work, the labs, uh, that that'll be possible in person. Warren, Thank Warren you. Madden, did you have a question? Nope, okay. No, I don't have a question. <laughs> okay. I saw he had unmuted himself. Well, I will ask on Wendy, just in general, the... Oh. Wait, he has a question after all. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I just thought, Wendy, there, there's a lot of dialogue about crowd events, athletics and concerts and all that. Is there any sense of how Iowa State will work through decision-making in those areas? Some of that obviously involves the Big 12 and other other groups. Is that part of, that's part of the summer planning process? Well, it's certainly part of uh, uh, summer and fall. So I meet twice a, twice a month with the Big 12 Board of Directors and we have conversations about what is the next step? What are the decisions that can be made? Uh, when would we allow uh, football players to come back to train? Uh, what do we think about uh, how we will uh, play football uh, this fall? So there's a lot of conversations underway, uh, but at this point, uh, no real decisions to share with you other than a decision that was made way back in March, and that is really everything was, was halted uh, through May 31st. I don't see any other questions. Okay. Well, I had a question. Oh, ah. Go ahead. Uh, this is Alka. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Wendy, for your very insightful presentation and information. I wanted to know what about uh, the international students? Will they be still uh, able to apply? And if so, um, will they, because of the travel ban in many countries, will they still, how will they uh, be able to uh, attend classes? And those that are here currently at the university, um, they would like to be going home for a vacation during the fall or winter time. So what, uh, what are some of the answers for that? And the second part is many colleges are giving um, uh, pass fail grades instead of the letter grades also. Uh, they've turned to that. I don't know what uh, Iowa State has done, and would you be changing that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, when we think about our international students, uh, we we really value our international students. Uh, it is an important aspect of Iowa State University and has been for a very, very long time. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, issue, the, the problem with visas is real. Uh, we talk about uh, visas, we talk about policies uh, with our inter that impact our international students. We talk about these issues with our congressional delegation on a regular basis. Uh, but it would help if everybody else would do that too. Uh, because we think the value of having our international students here is just so important. It's not just for Iowa State, and it's not even for just the students themselves, but you think about the talent pool that this country is missing out on uh, by the current approaches, uh, that is a real loss, uh, in my opinion. So, uh, so we work hard to communicate about our concerns about uh, issues related to visas and what that impact that has for our international students. Uh, we are uh, talking about internally about uh, our international students that are new, uh, saying that you can join online for your first semester or year at Iowa State and then come uh, join in person, hopefully. So we're trying to think about how we continue to cultivate and reach out and connect with international students all over the world. So it's still a high priority for us and we're gonna continue uh, to think creatively uh, about how we can maintain that important part of the Iowa State community. 
Regarding pass fail uh, or pass not pass, uh, we did in fact implement that policy uh, for this uh, past spring semester. Uh, there really wasn't uh, seemingly another option. So students had the all, they had that all alternative uh, that they could make a decision after they saw what their letter grade was. Uh, so you had to have a C, I believe I'm right in saying this, to get a pass. Um, uh, but you could choose to have a pass instead of a, 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 a C on your, um, on your transcript. So we did implement that policy. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, amidst uh, many challenges, there is a silver lining. So hopefully everything will work out. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I just end by saying, I think the silver lining is how we've all responded. I watched the community at Iowa State and in Ames uh, respond again with such care and concern for each other. And that is really what makes us such a wonderful place to be. And so I would just say thank you to everybody for all you've done to respond uh, to the COVID-19 crisis in, in such a important, meaningful manner. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Wendy. And I wanna give a, another shout out again to ISU Dining Services for doing the food runs to the Food Bank of Iowa to our 22 pantries. We worked with Iowa State pop-up uh, pantry on campus and ISU Dining has also been our, um, uh, they pick up uh, pasta from Barilla and I'm talking 12,000 to 15,000 pounds of pasta. Uh, just they, they resorted it and they got it out to our food pantries, not once, not twice, but three times, and they're continuing to do that. So um, I think that everybody agrees with me when I say, and, and everybody knows this already, so Iowa State is, uh, is the gem in the community of Ames and Story County, and we are so fortunate that the university is here, and so fortunate that you're willing to sit at the table and are at the table with the other emergency operation centers to talk about how we can get through this as a community. And that community includes the Iowa State students. Um, for me, after being here 34 years, I know that uh, summer is always that little time of, well, you can get down Lincoln Way without a whole lot of traffic, but by August, we're all saying, oh, I'm really anxious for the, the students to get back. And I know that this summer more than ever, um, I would love to, I would love to be backed up on Lincoln Way so that I could see students walking across campus again. So um, keep that in mind for everybody as we move through this together, like we've been saying all along. I do want to let you remind you that we won't be on our Zoom call next week. It is Memorial Day and it is hard to keep track of the days uh, of the week and, and the days on the calendar during this COVID-19 pandemic. And so, um, but I think a special celebration on Monday in your small gatherings um, with your mask on and your social distancing is, is totally appropriate, but you won't be on the Zoom call on Monday. Uh, we will be back on uh, June 1st, I believe. We have a program on June 1st and we'll be back on the Zoom call. I wanna let you know how, um, how great it is to see the Zoom calls working for our Rotary Club. <clears throat> I was just kind of tracking as we went, we had on our high peak we had 96 um, folks on our call. Um, it's nice to have uh, the incoming district governor, uh, Elka, on the call. And I think I saw Steve Dakin somewhere on there as well. So he's our um, Steve has uh, a question. incoming district governor and you're the governor. <laughs> yeah, Steve is before me. <laughs> Steve has okay. a question. Steve first and then Elka. I'm sorry, Karen. Okay, Steve. Hey, I want to thank Thank uh, Wendy and for her leadership. Uh, obviously, it goes much farther than just aim to tell you that. It touches the whole state from tra my travels. Incoming president-elect Hogger would say this is an opportunity. Unfortunately or fortunately, I'm becoming pretty adept to Zoom. And because our, our eyes not along any traveling, our compensation for traveling through the end of this year. I'll probably be doing most of mine on Zoom, but if anybody at small groups want to get together, I would be glad to come. But anyway, thank you again, Wendy, and I'm looking 
forward to uh, the coming year and all the yes good opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So my quote for the day is, uh, I did not find who this is from, so it's unknown, but don't lose hope. When the sun goes down, the stars come out. Keep that in mind. If you would please join me in the four-way test. I think Karen's gonna throw that up for us and so that we don't forget it. Jeff, you go ahead. Why should I call it up? I just want to take a moment to thank all of those who have volunteered to serve on the Centennial Planning Committee. Expect an email this week about our first opportunity together uh, by Zoom. So uh, please um, just watch your email. But thank you again for volunteering. We have about 20 individuals who agreed to serve in some capacity. All right, well, let's end it with the four-way test. Hopefully everybody remembers it. I have it written in front of me so I can cheat a little bit. And all that we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it, the is truth? it fair to all concerned? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it, Will it build, build a good build, well, build a better, better, better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? To all concerned. Thank you, President Winterstein. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon. Board members, remember you need to sign back on at one o'clock. Um, and I hope you have a very safe Memorial Day and that you are able to experience some kind of connection with your family and friends. Thank you. See you in June. Okay.